Well, at the outset, let me address something that you may be thinking. Uh, you may think, Ben, uh, I believe this is a Christmas service, but it seems to me you just read an Easter passage. Uh, I'm no churchologist, but it seems that you've got your holidays mixed up. Uh, shouldn't you be focused on a full manger and not an empty tomb? Uh, you got a nice church here, but uh, it just seems like that's a bit of a rookie move uh, to get a Christmas uh, service and have an Easter sermon. What are you doing? Well, let me just say, uh, number one, t take it easy, okay? Uh, and, and number two, let me say, uh, we've been journeying this fall through the life of Jesus as a church. We spent 15 weeks journeying through the Gospel of Mark. If you weren't with us on the journey, you can look on YouTube, podcast, wherever, and, and, and kind of walk through the life of Jesus with us. And, and this is where we've come to the end of that journey. And uh, we knew that this was going to happen. And this wasn't just like, oh, well, happenstance. Uh, we knew it was going to happen, and we were excited that we were going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus at Christmas, where we typically talk about the birth of Jesus. And you go, well, why was that exciting to you? Well, uh, let me explain it this way. Angels actually don't make that many appearances uh, in the Bible. They're supporting characters in the larger story. But I want to tell you what gets angels fired up, if you've ever wondered that. I mean, many of you, if, you, if you've been to Christmas gatherings, you know angels are popping up everywhere in the Christmas narratives. They're coming to Mary, they're coming to Joseph, they're coming to Zacharias, shepherds, a whole pastel of them comes. That angels are popping up here and there. Uh, but you see them excited, glory to God in the highest, but we don't see them for a while until the end. And we see that they are excited but none of the Christmas passages really explain to us the why. There's only one passage in the Bible that tells us why the angels are so amped that Jesus Christ has come. And it's actually the apostle Peter who tells us in 1 Peter. He says, concerning this salvation, that is the arrival of Jesus to rescue us, he says, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. If you've heard a lot of Christmas uh, sermons, you've heard all these quotes of the prophets from the Old Testament. And if you read the prophets, all of them knew a Christ is coming, the anointed one, a king, the hero of the human story is arriving to rescue us. But the prophets of old, none of them had the whole puzzle. They each had a piece. And so they didn't quite understand how it all fit. And then Peter tells us something interesting. The angels didn't either. They knew the king was coming. They knew a Messiah was coming, but they didn't quite know the dates and times. And so it says they were longing to look into the day of his arrival. Up in heaven, if you wonder what the angels were doing, they were kind of stacked at the door of the boardroom, trying to peek in and look at the whiteboard. When is God saying he's coming? They were longing to see the arrival of Christ. But did you notice what aspect of it got them so thrilled? They were longing to see the Christ suffering and his subsequent glories that what they were excited about is they knew he is going to suffer, but there will be glory on the other side. And that's what got them so excited. Uh, Hark the Herald uh, was a song that confused me as a child, uh, just to be honest with you, uh, because I didn't know what a herald was and I didn't know how to hark it. So I'm like, you're asking me to do something I don't understand. Uh, it wasn't until embarrassingly later in life that I realized I had the punctuation in the wrong place. Uh, it wasn't Hark the Herald, angels sing. It was hark, comma, the herald angels sing. I'm like, oh, a herald's a messenger uh, and an angel's a messenger. So saying herald angels a bit redundant, saying messenger, messenger. It's like saying chai tea. Chai means tea. And so you're just saying <laughs> tea, tea. And uh, I was like, all right, so there's some problems here. But Charles Wesley, with an assist from George Whitfield, wrote this uh, hymn saying, hark, listen, these herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. And in the last verse, they say about this king, he's born so that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. And I think they got it right. Why were the angels so fired up at the birth of Jesus? Because they knew 
The first birth of Jesus guaranteed our second birth. That's why. They knew what it meant. They knew that the wages of sin was death but the free gift of God was eternal life through his son. They knew that God so loved the world that he sent his son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. They saw the glories on the other side. They understood what Hebrews says, that since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy the one who had power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to his lifelong slavery. The reason the angels were excited about the birth of Jesus is because they knew the birth of Jesus meant the death of death, that the arrival of the king meant there's hope beyond the grave. One of the best titles of a book ever written was by John Owen. It was the death of death and the death of Christ. That's a great title. I wish I would have thought of it. That's good. <laughs> Why are the angels so amped at his arrival? Because they know glory to this newborn king because he's born so that we don't have to die. His birth guarantees our second birth. Eternal life forever with God and spiritual life now. The reason they were excited and the reason we were to talk about the resurrection of Jesus at the birth of Jesus is because this is what gives us hope. People talk about hope at Christmas and joy at Christmas, but why? If he just arrived and died, maybe he would inspire us a little bit, but we wouldn't sing like we do. The reason we celebrate his arrival is because it gives us hope beyond the grave. It's because we know a light dawned in the darkness. We know our failures and tragedies don't dominate our story. We know that all things won't end with a brokenness. It ends with a life beyond even the grave itself. That's why we get excited, because we disagree with Bertrand Russell who said no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. All the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. Happy holidays from Bertrand. That was his view. <laughs> we believe something else. We say no, he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope because a weary world rejoices, because yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Uh, I read an article this week about uh, holiday songs, and uh, the guy in the article was saying, you know, uh, I know they make a lot of money, that's why artists do them, they come out every year, everybody sings them, and he said, but honestly, I don't really resonate with them because they're all about shallow things that don't really touch the heart. And I thought, you know, this is interesting, it was a secular article, and, and I actually agreed with him that a lot of holiday songs do sort of focus on the trappings of it. Uh, Billboard just put out their top 100 greatest holiday songs of all time. Jesus doesn't crack the top 10. Uh, he's number 15. All the ones before it are about mistletoe and snow and hot chocolate and various paraphernalia. And so this guy's looking at that and saying, you know what? It doesn't really strike the heart. It does not produce hope and joy. And I think, yeah, no kidding. There's a big difference between petting a real dog and a taxidermist model of a dog. <laughs> they look the same, there's some fur, but after a while when you realize, hey, this one's not moving. I can poke its eyeballs and nothing happens. You go, you know what? I feel like I'm not dealing with something real. And you're not. And if you just sing about the trappings of the holidays, there's nothing wrong with them. Drink some hot cocoa, right? But if that's all you have, of course it feels hollow because you cut out the deep theological hymns this whole thing was rooted on that we believe the Son of God really came, really lived, really died for us and then really beat death to give us hope beyond the grave. So we have a real hope that's real because we have a heart in our gospel and it gives us hope. That's why we sing at Christmas that from the depths of hell his people he saved to give us victory over the grave. That's why we celebrate. So let me mention three things about this passage quickly, and then we can leave and maybe open one present tonight. I know that's a bit of a controversial idea. Some families practice, some don't. It's not a moral issue, by the way. Just to state that, you decide. God bless you and your choices. Let me make three points about this passage I just read from Mark. Number one is Mark does something very interesting. He's writing this as though it's history. He's telling you what happened like a reporter. 
Uh, it's interesting, verse one. He says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome bought spices so they might go anoint him. He mentions these women multiple times. We didn't read the couple paragraphs before, but he mentions them by name multiple times. They were with Jesus all week. They watched his crucifixion. They saw where he was buried. And now here they are coming back to anoint him after the Sabbath was passed. Jesus died on a Friday and Friday night began the Sabbath. You could do no work, couldn't buy anything. So they had to wait until what we would call Saturday night, that was the beginning of the next day, where they could buy some spices so they could go. Spices uh, were often put in tombs to offset the stench of decomposition. They believed he was dead and wanted to anoint his body. And so they arrived at the tomb, and then the verse tells us, uh, they realize who will roll the stone away from us from the entrance of the tomb. They realize we bought the spices, but we did not plan ahead. Uh, There's a stone here that was about five, six feet in diameter, weighed a couple hundred pounds. So they were like, man, we got spices. We forgot the dozen or more dudes who can roll this thing away. And they're realizing we three ladies don't have the juice to pull this off. But they show up and they realize, nope, we got a guy. And they enter that tomb. And there is, I would argue, the most excited angel in your Bible. The ones announcing his birth were excited, but they longed to look into his sufferings and subsequent glories. I think this guy got the monster pull. I mean, he's sitting there. I don't know the tone. It doesn't tell us, but I think he's sitting there like, okay, all right. Hey, hey guys. Okay, don't, don't, don't rush it. All right, don't be alarmed, but uh, he's not here. Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah, the one you're looking for? No mistake of who we're looking for. Not the wrong Jesus, not of the wrong tomb. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, the one that was crucified, just in case we're ta- not talking about a different Jesus, the one that was from Nazareth and crucified, that guy. That really narrows the pool, really down to one guy. Notice he's not here. He's not here. Go around, look around, look around, look around. He's not here. This is me. You know why he's not here? He's risen. Subsequent glories beyond the grave. That's why he came to give us a hope and a future. But what's interesting about this, and it's crazy that maybe doesn't strike you as nuts, is that Mark is just reporting this as though it's history. Uh, I took a class in seminary where we had to study ancient myths all throughout the Near East. They don't sound like this. They don't name people like this, talk about the details of what they were up to. He does this earlier at the crucifixion. We looked at that where he says, that uh, Simon of Cyrene carried Jesus' cross, and Mark throws in the father of Alexander and Rufus, which is a weird detail for us because we're like, okay, fine. But he was doing it for his original audience because they knew Alexander and Rufus. What Mark was doing here is he was saying, hey, we don't just believe in a mythical, spiritual idea of something that may have happened. No, a real man came, and he really died, and he was really buried and he really rose, go talk to the people who were there. In case you don't know, it was Mary. Salome was there. The other Mary was there. Ask Alex and Rufus. Their dad was there. He's telling you this happened. Uh, Ancient writing didn't have realistic fiction. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the Oxford Don, who became a Christian, wrote this. I've been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know none of them are like this. Talking about the Gospels. He says there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage or else some unknown ancient writer without known predecessor or successor suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic realistic narrative. The reader who does not see this has simply not learned how to read. Yeah, it gets a little personal at the end there, but his idea is he's writing this as if it really happened. The resurrection of Jesus confronts the mind. We believe this is a real story about a real man. And some people go, well, I don't know. Maybe they made up the story. Well, we won't get into all this. You you wouldn't make it up this way because of the characters in it and because of the perspective. Uh, Back then, uh, the testimony of women was not seen as of particular value. Don't shoot the messenger, ladies. I'm just telling you how things were back in the day. And so if you were making up a story you wouldn't put women as the eyewitnesses. That would undermine your story. Actually, if you read second century literature, um, that was a critique of people who hated Christianity. There was a, a critic of Christianity named Celsus that would debate Christians, and his mic drop argument at the end was like, well, who saw the resurrection? Women? <laughs> he just thought, that kills the whole thing, right? Uh, because their testimony is not of value. You wouldn't write it this way unless this is how it went down. And so Mark's not fabricating his story. This seems to be how it played out. Also, if you were writing this story, 
typically when you write founding stories, you don't want the founders to look like idiots. But the disciples are on the struggle bus all through the crucifixion and resurrection. I don't know if you know this, but they were having a pretty tough time. And notice, they're not there. What's tough about that is in chapter eight, Jesus said, hey, I will be killed, and after three days, I will rise again. In chapter nine, he said, the son of man will be killed and will rise from the dead. And later in chapter nine, he says, they will kill me, and after I'm killed, three days, I'll rise again. Chapter 10, he said, they will mock me, spit on me, flog me, kill me, but after three days, I'll rise again. In chapter 14, he says, after I rise, I'll meet you in Galilee. So he keeps telling them, gonna die, three days, gonna rise, I'll see you there. Gonna die, three days, gonna rise, see you later. And after he died, they're like, well, dead people don't come back, this story's over, and they're not there. It's not a good look. And yet they weren't predisposed to supernatural ideas. They weren't like, well, you know, like maybe we'll just make up that he rose from the grave. They didn't do that with any other would-be messiahs. Uh, they were caught off guard by the supernatural power of this man. And yet Mark writes this story because something happened. A disbelieving, skeptical group of people suddenly worshiped Jesus as their resurrected king and were willing to die for him. One of the greatest apologetics for this message is, is us the existence of the Christian church. And look, there's a lot more we could say about this, but I just wanna make the point here. Mark is going through great pains to report to you a historical event. A real man named Jesus really lived, really died, really rose, and it really changed all of human history. And he's going through the effort to show you this is history, and it's our story. I just wanna challenge you to do the same. No one changed history like this man I challenge you, take him seriously. Think about who he is and think about what he's done because what he's saying here is that the Jesus we sing about is not just a saccharine sweet feelings of goodness. It's a man who really beat death and that's why we have hope beyond the grave. But it's not just that it confronts the mind. I love the way Tim Keller said this. He said, it doesn't just confront the mind, it comforts the heart. That we don't just have a future beyond the grave physically, We've got a comfort emotionally right now. And you know, where are we getting that from? From those two little words, and Peter. Many of you, even if you're not familiar with the Bible, know the story that Jesus, on the night he was gonna be betrayed and killed, he told his disciples at dinner, one of you is gonna betray me, all of you are gonna scatter. And Peter's like, not me. He said, the rest of these guys might. I mean, they're suspect, but I'm gonna stand strong. I'll never leave you. And Jesus was like, bruh. You're not going to make it 12 hours. Before the rooster crows, you're going to tell a whole bunch of people you don't even know me, right? And what's devastating is that happened. And not only did Peter reject the Christ that he had an allegiance to, Peter's sense of personal identity got crushed. And some of you know what that's like. You've, you've got a sense of you as a moral person. And, and maybe if I tell you that you've fallen short of God's standard, you're like, well, who hasn't? And, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. But you've got a personal standard. And you know when you violated that, it crushed your sense of self. And that shame, for some of us, made you not want to enter a room like this today. You don't like to darken the doors of these places because they remind you of the shame. But the good news of Christmas is not just hope beyond the grave. It's hope right now for forgiveness in life. Because Peter, who denied him three times, when the angel came, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. He'll see you in Galilee. What he's saying there is, I know who you are. I know what you've done. And I want you. I came to die (laughs) for your sin so you don't need to carry the weight and the shame of it anymore. I carried it, I buried it, and the hope of his arrival is this, that you can walk out of here knowing I got the gift of forgiveness, I got the gift of life, I got a Jesus Christ who knows me inside and out, has seen all the dark, sad, tragic places, and says, I still choose you. And Peter became something else, not to earn God's approval, but because he had an inexhaustible love that changed him from the inside out. God rest ye, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. 
to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. If you feel astray, this is for you. He came for failures like you and like me. That's why he came. So we celebrate at Christmas because we got life beyond the grave and we got love right now because he died for us. And let me tell you just, again, we'll move quickly past this, but some of you go, well, Ben, you don't know what I've done. And I would say, you're right, I don't. But I know what he has done. And I know you can't out the grace of Jesus. So don't disrespect his sacrifice by thinking you overpowered it. He beat the grave. He beat the devil. He gave us life beyond the grave. You may have done some heinous things, and there may be some consequences physically that you can't get out of, but you can spiritually have hope today because he can change you from the inside out. Last thing I want to say is this. Not only does he confront the mind, you must take this man seriously. Not only does he comfort the heart, you can have hope today. There's forgiveness and life for anyone in this room who would come to him. But it also challenges the life. That's the way this ends that's so wild. You notice the angels, again, pretty amped. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified, not here. He's risen. And then what he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter, he'll meet him. Go and tell it. And then the book ends in verse eight. And they went out and fled for trembling and astonishment seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Seen. That's the end of the book. That's the end of the gospel of Mark. It's like a weird twist. You're like, what? No, he just said, go tell everyone. And they told no one. This is weird. And it's so weird that later in history, people would add endings to Mark and, and they were always separated. So people knew they weren't originally from Mark, but it's just as the gospels were passed around, they knew some people would be dying to know the end. So guys were later like, and they ended up going and telling everybody, obviously, because how did you get a hold of this? And so, yeah, so eventually people found out, okay? And then they let people know and, and they got jotted down and we all know, you know, like they just had to close the loop for some people that were stressed. But if you've been reading Mark, you know, this is how he's been playing us the whole time. So many stories when Jesus would do something miraculous, he'd end it with a question. Jesus would calm the storm and they'd go, who is this man that even the winds and waves obey him? And the next day they were hungry and they got, and you're like, wait, no, who is this man? And you realize what Mark's doing is he's breaking the fourth wall. After Jesus calms the storm, he goes, so who is this man that the winds and waves obey him? Who has the authority to even forgive sins? Who is this guy? Who do you think he is? You just watched him love the outcast. You watched him care for the stranger. You watched him embrace the orphan. You watched him die an innocent man, but beat death and promised us it was that through the blood of his covenant, we can have friendship with God. And he said he would rise from the grave and he did. And he offered that life to us. Now we're meant to go and tell people death is not the end. Shame is not the end. Guilt is not the end. And then Mark goes, and then they didn't do it. And his hope is that you would go, what? No, this is the best news ever. That death is not the end. That there's hope beyond the grave. That shame is not the end. I can have forgiveness in life even now. This is the best news you can tell anybody. Someone needs to tell people. Somebody ought to tell people. And Mark's like, yeah, somebody should. Don't you think? If this is real, if it's not real, then we're wasting our time here, is what Paul says. But if this is real, this is the best news in the universe. Hope beyond the grave, forgiveness even now, peace with God, because Jesus Christ was born, lived the perfect life we could not, died the death we deserved, but then paid for our sin in full. And how did you know it was paid? because he walked out of that grave and he invites us to life with him. That's the hope and the message. And Mark Jumanji's us at the end. You don't get to play it passively from a distance. You want a part of this game? It's gonna draw you in. It's gonna call you to be a part of the story. 
that we're meant to take this message and go tell it on the mountains, over the hills, everywhere, even tell it on U Street, <laughs> tell it in Washington, D.C. You tell it to anybody who will listen. You tell it to family members and friends and strangers. And My wife got on a wreck on the, the GW Parkway a couple weeks ago and wasn't her fault some guy hit her from behind. Which, you know, as her husband made me upset. So I wanted to know if she was okay. I drove out there to see if she's all right. And then I'm mad, hey, this, you threatened to life of my wife because you weren't paying attention, looking on the phone, I don't know what you were doing, but man, you could have killed her, this is crazy, you could have killed somebody else. But by the time I got there, Donna was okay. And I found out that uh, the guy that had run over from Teddy Roosevelt Island to check on her after he saw the crash, ran up to the car and said, ma'am, are you okay? And she said, do you know Jesus? And he said, yes, I do. And she's like, all right, good. And he called 911, got an ambulance there, whatever. And when I got there, she was telling the ambulance driver about Jesus. I started to take photos of the car for insurance purposes. And I captured a moment where she was telling the guy who hit her, I forgive you, I'm okay, do you know Jesus? <laughs> and she invited him to church. And we were laughing about it later, a friend of hers said, you were in shock, and look what comes out of you, you're a shock evangelist. <laughs> that when it all boils down and you're at the doorstep of life and death, what matters? What matters is do you know Jesus? No one changed history like this man, and he claimed to be God. No one offers hope like this man, and he claimed to take sin and shame away for you and me. No one looked into the face of death, was ground up in its gears, and then emerged on the other side, except this man. And he offers us that kind of life, and that's why we sing, because we got a king, born so that man no more may die.